My name is Gary Art, and I'm the host of Everything Everywhere Daily. Okay, awesome. I had a really good time researching you, and I'm so impressed. So I'm really excited to learn from you. Before we dive in, I guess let's get the Cliff's notes of what brought you to podcasting and your foray into starting your show. I had been podcasting for a long time. So oh, I started really? a yeah, I started a formal podcast back in 2009 called This Week in Travel. And I did that until the pandemic kind of ruined everything about travel. And I had even been doing streaming audio back in around like 99 and 2000 through Winamp. Like I played with an EverQuest guild and I was like the DJ for the guild and everyone would just listen on Winamp. So that was before. And I also did a thing called All Game Radio back then. Again, it was just live streaming. We never recorded anything. I don't uh -huh. know why. But so I've been doing it a long time. But most people know me for travel photography. Back in Your 2007. photos are gorgeous. I am blown away. <laughs> well, thank you. So in 2007, I sold my home. And I thought I would travel around the world for a year. And one year turned out to be a decade. I just kept traveling and I was on the road full time. I eventually got an apartment, but I would still spend half to a third of the year on the road. And February 28th, 2020, I came home from my last international trip in Portugal, got COVID the first week of March. Oh, and in that month, everything in my life changed. The entire travel and tourism industry collapsed. All my income disappeared, I'd guess 95% of it. All mm -hmm. the traffic to my website, all the affiliate income, all the contracts I had signed up to do photography, all gone. And I didn't know what to do. At first, I thought this would be over in a few weeks, like everybody did. Like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, April, May, we'll be, we'll be back to doing this. And, and that obviously didn't happen. And I talked to some people I knew who were rather higher up in the, the travel and tourism world to talk to him about this. And they told me, it's like, no, 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 th this is going to take years. And I was already having problems with the world of blogging and social media before this started, mm -hmm. that there was a lot about it that I just didn't like. In the old days of blogging, people used to follow you through RSS. You had an RSS reader and they would read everything you wrote, or at least see the headline appear in their feed. And, and your website was your social media. And people would come and comment. And so as I was traveling around the world, I would just write my thoughts about a place. I wasn't doing SEO. I would use some clever title, a pun, a, a song lyric or whatever. And I just wrote my thoughts and people would leave comments. And that eventually all died when Google killed Google Reader and everything started to go towards, you know, they would follow you on Facebook or Twitter rather than your website. And then it devolved into clickbait. And today... Most travel blogs, 90% of their traffic is coming from Google. So everybody's writing the same few articles, top right. 15 things to do in blank. And it, it's not fun. And it's not really something I ever kind of wanted to do. So I had an idea of a podcast a few years ago using the name of my website, Everything Everywhere, that was not going to be travel focused. It was going to be more educational, history focused. Falling back to the things I learned while traveling, but not talking about where to stay, where to eat, things like that. I got the artwork done. I got everything about it done. And I began doing research for my first episode, which was going to be explaining why the Mona Lisa was the most famous painting in the world. Why was this painting of a random Italian woman who wasn't a queen? She wasn't in the Bible. Uh -huh. Why? Why is this the most famous painting? And I ended up with enough research to do like a three hour show. And I kind of did the math and I realized this probably wasn't going to work as a business. So I shelved <laughs> the idea and came back to it after the pandemic. And I was like, can I just well, say what? more podcasters should say that to themselves? Like, this is not going to work as a business. Let me kind of retool this and think about how I can rearrange my kind of passion with the idea a little bit. You know, most podcasters would have <laughs> ran with that three hour podcast on the Mona Lisa. <laughs> No. And at, at one point I met a friend, we were both speaking at an event and we were in the speaker's reception and he, he was, he's done very successful. He's had many books on the New York times bestseller list. He ran a massive event where he had like a thousand people show up and he, he stopped the event and he stopped everything else. And I asked, why, why are you doing this? He said, cause I started a daily podcast and it's the best thing I've ever done. And so I thought of that and I was like, 
okay, let's let's revisit this idea, but let's think of a daily podcast. Yeah. Instead of doing one three-hour episode, what if I just did a 10-minute episode? Instead of taking a howitzer to a topic, what if I used a shotgun approach? And that's kind of filling an evolutionary niche that a lot of history podcasts don't take. Most podcasts take one subject and they go really, really deep. So right. I was thinking, okay, what if I what if I took the opposite approach? What if instead of being the bricks, I was the mortar? That I offered a little bit of something every day that somebody could appreciate that's just kind of an, an overview or an introduction. So I did the math on that and that worked out really well. Mm -hmm. For example, if you had a one hour podcast that had 14 ads in it, that would probably be excessive, I would think, for most people. Right. But what if you had a daily podcast with two ads in it? Mm -hmm. That turns out to be 14 a week. But you don't notice it because it's split up over seven different shows. And so I was like, and I just, you know, okay, average CPM, but I was like, yeah, <laughs> the thresholds you need for the number of people listening, because you're doing a, a, an episode every day, that's seven times the number of episodes in a weekly show, you get more downloads. I was like, well, you can hit a threshold for actually making a living off this a lot less. Mm -hmm. So I pitched this, this idea to some of my friends who had very popular podcasts and they all had the same idea or they had the same response. One, this is a great idea. Two, you're insane because this is going to be a lot of work. Yeah. And so I created a list of 100 show ideas. And July 1st, 2020, I uh, released the first show. And it was a, it's a scripted show. So every day I'm writing a 2000 word script. I basically write a term paper every day. Uh -huh. So my show I released today that I did last night was a biography of Harry Houdini. The show tomorrow is going to be a brief history of paper. And I'll do everything from topics in science and mathematics to geography, to history, to biographies, you name it. Learn something new every day. That's kind of the, the premise of the show. And it, it was a difficult thing because it's not the kind of thing people are looking for. No one says, oh, I want to find a show about everything. Right. Right. And it violates all the rules people tell you about podcasting. Oh, you got to niche down. You have to get a real specific niche. I'm like, no, my show is literally about literally about everything. It's in the title. So it took a while. There's always been steady growth, but it really took a while for things to kind of ramp up. And what I ended up finding is that people were once they found the show, they became obsessed with it. Like I've it's almost easy done to a binge. thousand. Yeah, exactly. You can... They're like Doritos. Yes. It's a 10 minute thing. And if I have a three hour show, I'm asking a commitment of the listener that's very large. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you notice this, but of all the podcasts I listen to, I always listen to my daily podcasts first because oh. they're short and I can get them out of the way. Right. So pod news with James Cridlin. First thing I listen to, it's right. five minutes done. And I can clean out my queue of podcasts by getting rid of the daily ones. And people started saying, yeah, I listen to this on my commute. I listen with my children. I take them to school. We listen at night. And all of a sudden, I started getting groups of people that I never thought about that were listening to the show. And people started saying, yeah, Gary, I've listened to every episode. I was like, what? And then people started saying, I've listened to them twice or three times. And mind I, you, I almost have a thousand episodes. And so I created this thing called the Completionist Club. And if you ever remember Saturday Night Live, where they have the five timers club, where a host no. does it for the fifth. So oh, yeah, like, yeah, started, yeah, yeah. Like Steve Martin or Martin Short, and they all have their smoking jackets in this fictitious right. five timers club. So I created a similar thing, the completionist club. And so when someone from a new country joins, I say, oh, well, then, you know, I'll have some food that I know from their country or, or some reference. And, uh, you know, just talk to the keys to the doorman. He'll let you in. And, you know, if you're in the Canadian club, we always have Caesars and poutine available stuff like that. So it That's became cute. kind of a, a, a gimmick. So yeah, uh, from the, the rather humble beginnings of the show, we've had 13 million downloads now, and we've had a million downloads on average for the last three months. Yeah. I think the show still has a lot of potential for growth. So. Yeah. Okay. So there's so many things I want to dive into. I guess first, what I want to discuss is, you know, we touched on it a little bit, but that short episodes. I feel like that's a new trend in podcasting. I want to speak to that surface area a little bit more and how you kind of landed on the 10 minutes. And if you've noticed anything from 
any variation that might be in your catalog? I guess there's not much, huh? Have you done like 20 minute episodes or anything? And do you notice a difference? The longest episode I've ever done was 18 minutes. And that was on my episode of the Sight and Sound magazine decadal survey of the greatest movies of all time. And that was just because I had a lot to say about all the different movies. And I think the shortest one I ever did was five or six minutes, but they average about 10 to 12 minutes. And people um, listen regardless. Yeah. It's not that much of a, you know, whether it's difference. 15 minutes or eight minutes. Uh, I noticed is, so a is, huge difference. And I don't know if you know from your earlier podcasting days, how long your shows were, but I was doing a show that was like sometimes, you know, well over an hour, you know, it was interview based and as I've been tightening it up more and more, sometimes I even have a 20 minute episode, 30, 40, usually it's in the 30, 40, sometimes 50 range, but the shorter episodes, I do think there is something to, for a first time listener looking at that and being able to say, yes, I'm going to commit for this first time and maybe they'll love it. And then it's easier to say yes to a 30 minute or a 40 minute podcast, you know? I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think you have to respect the listener's time. And the nice part about doing a scripted show is that the episodes are always very tight. When you do an interview show, there's a tendency to ramble and talk right. about other things. And uh, you have to do more editing. Mm -hmm. the editing and production of my show is super easy. It's the easiest thing I do. The hard part is the writing and research. And I think that's that's one thing I got from this that I think most podcasts should probably get something from is to make a show tight mm -hmm. remove a lot of the extraneous parts of an interview uh, mm -hmm. that aren't necessary to, to get down to the essentials to respect the listener's time yes i totally agree with that and i do think there's definite correlation in growth when you do that okay so let's talk about your process how you get ideas how you research them how you script them how does that kind of work are you doing it every day are you batching i do it every day I could batch it if I could, if they were written, but it's the writing and research that takes the time. So the average episode takes me about four to six hours to do, almost okay. all of which is writing and research. So what I do is I have a running list in Google Docs that I just, every time I come up with an idea, I put it there. And so right now it's about 825 episode ideas. And every time I do an episode, I come up with a new episode idea right? because it just kind of one begets another begets another. I'll be doing an episode on something. And then I mention it's like, Oh, I should really explain what that is in another episode. So I did never that gonna in run one of, of yeah, you did that in one of the episodes I was listening. You were like talking about game theory or out of Africa or something. And you were like, Oh, and actually I'm going to do an episode about, you know, whatever that's related. And you called it out in the episode. And I was like, Oh, I bet that's how it works. I bet he gets ideas you know, it just kind of like trickles out. It's like a web. Yeah. So I, I don't know when that new episode is going to occur. For example, I did an episode on the Babbage engine, which was the first, it was a mechanical computer created in the 19th century. And the first computer programmer was a woman by the name of Ada Lovelace, who was enthralled with the Babbage engine and figured out how to actually do stuff with it. And I did the Babbage engine episode. I was like, oh, and Ada Lovelace, I will do an episode on her in right. the future. And I did. And about once a week, I'll run a rerun just so I get a day off. And I made sure to run the Babbage Engine episode just before I did the Add a Lovelace episode. Nice. So, and then Add a Lovelace, like, well, then there's a whole bunch of people in the history of computing, like Grace Hopper and, and other people that Vannevar Bush all had these ideas about computing. And this just goes to new, you know, ideas that you can do. And like I said, it never kind of ends. What have you found to be your best sources that you can kind of rely on and go to over and over again? And do you have, a rhythm for fashioning the script or kind of a regular format you follow? It depends on the topic. So there needs to be some sort of story arc. Right. Even if it's like tomorrow's episode is about paper. Okay. So I'll start by talking about papyrus, which is not paper, but the Egyptians developed papyrus first. And I'll explain why papyrus was not paper and why it was never a great solution because it was hard to make. The Chinese then made paper proper. You know, how was it different? And then how did paper spread? And then the different techniques for making paper and then the different uses for paper. Because paper was originally just made for things like writing. And then eventually we got to the point where we were packaging stuff in it and wiping our butt with it. Well, you know, it's a long way from the Gutenberg Bible 
to Charmin. And right. the process of making paper, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. So there has to be some sort of arc. And I always have that problem for a lot of shows. It's like, yeah, okay, I know how I'm going to start it or I know how I'm going to end it. And I'm like, well, what, how do I explain this other part? And a lot of times I found it's by simply explaining or providing more expository that I can get over the hump. Oh, and yeah. I've, I also have to realize that a lot of people may not be familiar with the topic at all. I'm usually pretty familiar. I, th the reason I chose this kind of podcast is I felt that this was something I had a comparative advantage in. I have five degrees in five subjects. <laughs> I spent 10 years traveling around the world. You got to put it to good use. <laughs> I got all this stuff. And because of the pandemic, I had a lot of time on my hands. Uh -huh. So I felt I was one of the few people that could pull it off and would pull it off. So I know a little bit about a lot of these things before I start writing. Like I could give you a couple sentence summary of it. And then a lot of times the research is filling in the gaps, getting dates, statistics, things like So I did a recent episode on Rosie the Riveter. Uh-huh which is basically uh, women in the home front during World War II. And finding statistics on this was actually surprisingly hard. Yeah, um, the bet. number of women in the workforce. And that I, I probably spent half my research time just trying to do that. So like, but, where but, would you for that? Like, where would you, are you just Googling like all the sources you can, or are you, you know, doing databases? Like, where are you kind of going? It depends. Like I said, it's all over the place. Sometimes because it's a 10 minute show and I'm really just trying to provide a summary, I will find sources that just give me too much. Right. And I really need to kind of summarize it down into the basics and I'm always leaving something out. So that, man, it really depends. But there a lot of these topics, can... you could even go to Wikipedia to just be like, okay, what's the gist of it? And then start, you know, zeroing in on like your idea for it. I'm sure you're more advanced than that, but, but I'm just but saying. Wikipedia can be, Wikipedia can be a mixed bag because sometimes it's too much uh -huh. and sometimes that's not enough. And I have to go someplace else to find an alternative that kind of explains it better. And there are some topics that I do off the top of my head. Really? Uh, like one of my what? degrees is it, uh, anything about math. I have oh. a degree in mathematics. So I did an episode explaining infinity. This was a really hard episode because trying <sighs> to do this without visual aids is difficult. And so there's a proof in mathematics called the Cantor diagonal proof. And it, it, there's no advanced mathematics at, at all. It's very easy to comprehend, but it basically proves that some infinities are bigger than other. And that's a statement that at first it's like, well, that makes no sense because right. infinity is, is, is infinite. And then you go through it and you can show that, well, no, there's some infinities bigger than you're like, oh, so that was kind of a risky episode. I didn't know if it would fly, but I guess it did. But yeah, anything dealing with mathematics. So I'll do an ep I have an episode coming up in the history of negative numbers, which we don't think twice about, but that was a huge philosophical breakthrough for people. The idea that a number could be negative or even zero. Right. Uh, zero came from ancient India. And the, uh, there were a lot of cultures that had a resistance to zero because how could there be nothing? So yeah, those are the ones that, and I, I did one back in 2020 when the election was taking place. I never talk about current events in the show. That's one of the things I did a study of one star reviews for podcasts. Yeah, I and I always that. found that there were, there were two things that came up. Unnecessary politics, meaning if you're going to do a political show, go nuts, be a political show, nothing wrong with that. But trying to insert politics in snarky comments usually always backfires. Mm -hmm. So I never do that. And uh, I don't use any foul language. There's a podcast that I used to listen to. I loved it. I listened to it for years. The hosts were incredibly crude and it always came back to bite them. There's some people that don't care about language and that's fine. I, I don't really care. But there are some people that are turned off by it and there are guests that are refused to appear on the show because they were so crude. And I realized that there was no real benefit to it. Right. What I then realized is that people started saying, oh, I listened to it with my kids or I listened to uh, teachers were saying mm -hmm. I assigned this for homework. And I didn't think of that when I started the show. But then I realized this is a huge side benefit that I can now tap into these things. Whereas if I was using expletives, I couldn't have done that. Right. Plus, you don't need it. This is fucking game theory. Like what? Right. <laughs> and then, yeah, I imagine like the recording, you're just like doing it until you get one or two takes or three takes or however many, you know, if you flub something, you just do pickups. How does that work? Yeah. So I just uh, start reading until I get to a point where uh, I flub up 
or I want to give the emphasis a little different. And then I just move the waveform back. I used GarageBand to a break in the sentences or the paragraph. And then I just start from that point again. And so by the oh, time I'm done reading efficient. the script, by the time I'm done reading the script, it's fully edited and done. So Amazing. that's what I was saying. The, the production is very simple. The only thing I really have a hard time with is the pronunciation of certain non-English words, especially proper names. And I have to rely very heavily on different sources for that. Google Translate actually works really well if it's a popular language like French or Mandarin Chinese or mm -hmm. you know Korean. And then if you've ever noticed in Wikipedia, usually the very first thing after the main word of a topic will be the pronunciation in IPA script. And there's a thing called IPA reader where I can cut and paste the thing from Wikipedia, paste it, and then it will pronounce it properly based on the IPA pronunciation. And a lot of times, if you read a word for the first time or you read someone's name, what you're pronouncing in your head may not be the correct pronunciation. Right. And then I'll also go down. There are other pronunciation websites or even YouTube videos where I'll just look for someone who's using that word or that name in context so I at least have an idea of how it's used. What is it? IPA? IPA-reader.xyz. A... Oh, that's such a good hack. Okay. Amazing. Let's get into, you kind of shared some things that helped you grow your podcast with me. And I want to talk about that. You tweeted this cool, like a graph, and then you had a bunch of, it was a thread about how you grew your show. So I'd love to get into some of that stuff. So what was your kind of like launch strategy with this show? Step one was get out the door. And I spent my first month of the podcast, making sure the podcast was available everywhere. Pandora took forever. Spotify took a while. Apple took a while. I claimed my podcast wherever you could claim a podcast. I did that. And the other thing I did is I ignored every podcast guru that was out there because one, and, and I've noticed this in blogging as well. A lot of the gurus never had successful shows because if they had successful shows, they would be making their money off the show, not telling people how to do podcasts. Yeah. So I looked at, okay, who has successful shows? Well, these big networks like Wondery and iHeart and whatnot, what do they do? And I also like listen to a lot of interviews with Jordan Harbinger and mm -hmm. Tala Hala, and they all kind of had the same thing. Social media doesn't work. The thing that really works is promoting podcasts on podcasts. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing I found growing. You know, I, I have a very large following on Instagram and Twitter. And I found when I grew those audiences, it was the same thing. You grow an audience on the platform you want to grow. Same is true with podcasting because 100% of the people listening to a podcast ad or a feed drop are listening to podcasts. And I should add that when everything went south with, with travel, I was basically broke, mm -hmm. right? So I did not have a lot of money to invest in this. So the plan was grow the show by whatever means possible. And then as I could get some, some money start to come in, invest all of it into growing the show, put it all into promotion. It gets a little bigger, more money comes in, throw all of it into promotion and kind of like a flywheel or pushing a large rock. As right. you keep doing it, you build up momentum. So what I started doing was buying ads and podcast apps. And the first ones were Podcast Addict and Overcast. I think those are the easiest ones to get into because you don't have to have a huge investment. You can the buy CPMs an ad. are kind of high though. Oh, well, okay. I, I need to explain this part. So one of the things I did when I did the math on how this works is I figured out the value of a subscriber. And it's a very simple calculation. You determine the average CPM for an ad, number of ads per episode, and then the number of episodes you have per year. And that will determine the average value of a subscriber for a year. Because I have a daily show, uh, that's, th well, let's say, a, a third of a thousand. It's a little more than that, but to make the math easy. So one CPM is a thousand ads, right? So by having a daily show, an individual will be worth one third of that or an RPM for the total number of ads I have in an episode. If you have a weekly show, that's about 50 per year. That's about 5%. So the average value for me, just in terms of advertising for a, a subscriber is approximately $16 per year. And that would be less than that if I had simply a weekly show with the same number of ads. A weekly show may have more ads, so you would have to adjust that. But using that as the base number, and it's not a perfect number, 
I get a lot of people listening to my back catalog that would increase it a little bit. Some people don't listen to everything that would decrease it. But using that number, I can get between one to three dollars for a subscriber on places like Overcast or Podcast Addict. So it actually is an extremely good deal, not a bad deal. But you need to know that number before you make the investment. And a lot of places I found where they do promotions, they will pay you per listens or downloads. And I have no interest in that. I really am looking for subscribers. Now I understand someone needs to listen to the show before they make a right. decision to subscribe. Right. But that's that's where I first started putting my money, a place like Podcast Republic. And then I started investigating every other app. And every app does it differently. So you have to really do the research. Podbean, Pocket Cast, Player.fm, CastBox. Did you do um, Buzzsprout? Yes, I've done that a couple of times. What do you think? I did it the first week they launched it, and it was okay. And then I did it months later, and it was a very different experience. I sold out. I did like 10,000 downloads worth, and it was all done within 10 hours. Oh, really? Like I had so many people that, yeah, that, like I think one of the things I would recommend that they do is actually dynamic pricing, because right now I think the supply of ad inventory is much greater than the number of people buying it because they've set it at a $20 CPM. And if they allow that number to fluctuate based on supply and demand, I think they would probably be bringing in more money. That's what Overcast does. Uh-huh. Interesting. So the second time, if they were served within 10 hours or whatever you're saying, like, did you see that growth on your end? My show is one of the problems is as the show gets bigger, it becomes harder, harder to tell yeah. if something works because I have fluctuations within the course of a week. My biggest day, I'll be getting 30 some thousand downloads. And on a Saturday, which is always my worst day, I'll be getting 20 some thousand. So that's several thousand variation over the course of a week. So if I did get a thousand extra downloads, it would be hard to tell uh -huh. because you can't attribute that. So at a certain point, once you have a feel for how things work, you just kind of have to trust the system and know that it works, that as people listen to you. And again, you can always just fall back. If I spend $200 on, that was my last Buzzsprout buy, which is not a lot. Right. Uh, knowing that I get $16 for value for a subscriber. And let, let's be conservative. Let's say that's 10 just to make the math easy. I would only need to get 20 subscribers. And that's a pretty low conversion rate. A conversion rate that's so low, I'm fairly confident that I can get that. Okay, that's awesome. Any other places, you know, obviously it was easier to tell in your early days. Like if you were going to rank them, what would be like your top two that you're like, oh, okay, I would definitely do these again. Podcast Republic is a place I'm pretty much advertised nonstop every month just because it's a very good deal. Podbean, I thought was a, a very good deal for what I spent with what I got. The worst was probably Castro and yeah. Player.fm. Okay. Player.fm provides a lot of gaudy numbers. If you ever look at a podcast on Player.fm, you'll see, oh, tens of thousands of subscribers. And what I think happens is you are simply subscribed by default to anyone who downloads the app that <laughs> while your ad is running. And so you get these big gaudy numbers for subscribers, but it doesn't translate into downloads. Yeah. And what I care about is, is people actually listening to the show. Have you tried Mopod? I have not. And I've looked into it. I don't understand where they're getting these listeners from. I pay money and then I get listeners. Then it's a big black box in the middle. Yeah. So I don't know what's happening. And then, like I said, I don't care about listeners. I care right. about converting. I might be willing to try it in the future to see if I can get some sort of conversion. But as of yet, I haven't. So when you say, oh, it's a very high CPM, when it comes to something like Mopod, I agree. That is a very high CPM. That's why I've been shied away from it. Now, if somebody from there is listening to this and they want to talk to me and explain to me in more detail how their process works, I'm very open to it. But for the most part, it's not something I think my money would be better spent in other places. Gotcha. Well, for me, I mean, I'm much smaller, so it's easier for me to tell like when something is actually translating into downloads for me. And so far, Mopod seems like the best, but I'm not, you know, I'm not tracking subscribers in the way that you are. Okay. So let's talk about swaps and feed drops. And you're saying this is the number one way to grow an audience. 
What was your uh, yeah. strategy? Well, swaps, uh, swaps are basically free. And if you're doing dynamic insertions, it makes it a lot easier to kind of use up available inventory. And I signed on with a network now, so they handle a lot of that. So when I get a request, but they're also doing a lot of that. So we just did a swap with a show that's done by the Discovery, the Time Warner Discovery. We've done it with the TED Talks. Uh, we've done it with Pushkin Media, Grammar Girl, uh, a lot of higher end networks. They've kind of discovered me as the show has started to grow. So we've done swaps with them. I'm sure we'll keep doing a lot of them in the future. Every time there's a new Wondery history episode or, or a podcast or season that comes out, they tend to buy either a fee drop or, a, or they just buy ads on my site and usually at a pretty high CPM, That's which great. also gives you some insight as to what they're doing and how they value mm -hmm. running ads, that they're willing to pay a much higher CPM. And the Jordan Harbinger show is the same thing. I was contacted by them and the CPM they were offering was much higher than average. So just to give you an idea, there's, there's definitely value there. And, and I'm going to be doing more of that. Right now, I'm kind of in a hiatus. The show has kind of run past my ability to sell ads. So I signed on with a new network and now they're ramping up the sales funnel. We got more advertisers. So revenue is now starting to come in. And once more money starts coming in, then I'm going to go right back to, you know, I'll, I'll pay for my rent and then everything's going to go back into the show. So I'm guessing that's going to restart again in June. And my goal for this year, and I still think it's very possible, is to try to do be doing 100,000 downloads a day by the end of the year. Good for you. Okay. So were you at the beginning handling your own swaps and feed drops and how were you finding people or you didn't uh, do that on your own? Yeah. Up until uh, the start of this year, I was pretty much doing it on my own with a couple exceptions. And as you grow, people kind of find you, they start to see your show popping up, you know, next to some of the shows on their network. And it's like, oh, then they click on it and they look at the number of reviews and go to Refonic and everything. It's like, okay, they're a player. So maybe that's a, a show that we could look at in terms of advertising on. So a lot of it's inbound. Yeah, but I'm going to be actually, one of the things I'm going to be doing is there's a Facebook group that has a lot of history podcasters in it. And I'm just going to go to all of them and say, want to monetize your show? Contact me. I will pay you X amount, you know, whatever your downloads are for a, a fee drop. And most of them, I'm pretty sure all of them have shows that are smaller than me, but that's fine. A lot of them have smaller shows, but they have a really, their, their listener Niche base audience. is a good target yeah. for me. So I think that would work very well. We're also doing other things. We're in talks right now to a very large nonprofit organization that has a particular day, which is celebrated every year. And so I'm going to do an episode on that day about the day and the history behind it. And then in turn, they will promote that episode via their mailing list to all their donors and, and volunteers. No money's changing hands, but hey, it's great. And that's the benefit of doing a show that is about everything. I can do an episode on damn near anything I want, so right. long as it's kind of interesting. And we realized, well, we could replicate this with a whole host of things. We could work with any large nonprofit group. We could do something with AARP, and I could do an episode on the history of Social Security yes. or the history of retirement and how a long time ago that didn't exist. And so there, there's all sorts of opportunities like that for the show. We just need to explore them. Okay, so you're, we're talking about this is a daily podcast. I want to know how many episodes you had in the can when you launched and how you have thought about, you know, your publishing schedule and the sustainability. Like, are you working ahead a certain amount? No. I have oh no episodes God. in the can. I do my episodes. I make them fresh every day. Damn. Usually I am done recording. I upload. It's available for download hours later. And before I went to PodFast, my, my sleep schedule was so screwed up. I was going to bed at eight in the morning and I would literally record <laughs> and people would download it instantly. And again, the issue is the ability to research and write. So one of the first hires I'm going to make as soon as I'm able to is a writer to try uh -huh. to take some of that burden off me. Yeah. If I were you, that would be my first hire too. <laughs> so glass box. I know David Segura. What has been your experience? I'm just curious. Did you keep your IP? Yeah, I own all of the, the intellectual property. I produce the show. I'm responsible for everything. They're responsible for bringing in advertisers and marketing and uh, potentially other business 
you know, relationships or developments that could happen down the road. We, we haven't officially signed a contract, but if it should ever happen that someone's interested in turning everything everywhere daily into a, a Netflix series or something like that, or a book, you know, they would certainly probably be involved with it. Okay. But it's been night and day compared to the network I was with beforehand. Night and day. In they what ways? Actual, well, the network I was with before didn't have a sales team. They just arbitraged, advertised cast, and would forward me an email from them that I had to approve. And oh. that's all it was. Yeah. And uh, they did next to nothing in terms of, they didn't even talk to me for like nine months, even though I was the biggest. I started out as like the smallest show on their network. And by the end of the year, I was the biggest. And they were trying to say, oh, well, we're responsible for your growth. I'm like, the hell you are. <laughs> I, I spent uh, thousands of dollars this year promoting my show that you had no involvement with and didn't even ask about. No, you are not. You sent one email on my behalf that led to a feed drop that I asked you to send. And that was it. But yeah, I, I, the, the monthly meetings they have, they have a whole staff. They're getting me lined up to appear on uh, other podcasts as guests with feed drops. You know, they have bigger shows in their network. So great. doing stuff with them, it, it's just been an overall far better experience. And I still have, you know, I still consider myself an independent podcaster insofar right. as I produce the show, I own the show, everything that that you hear as far as getting the show at the door, all the editing production, that's all me. Yeah. So it's still a one person operation except for ad sales. So Clubhouse, Michael Castaneda, he knew you and and recommended you and you guys met through Clubhouse and he was just like Gary's so cool because it'll just be like 10 audio nerds in a clubhouse and you're just down to like hang out and talk shop and you know you've got this super successful podcast. So, I guess what was your Clubhouse experience and yeah, what's your approach to the podcasting community and kind of making yourself known? I was in Clubhouse for its golden era, which was like two weeks in February of 2021, <laughs> maybe. And there were a bunch of podcast rooms at the time, and the show was still growing back then. So I was just doing a lot of listening. I'm, you know, I'm in the Discord server that Ariel Nissenblatt runs. The, I need to the, get in the, there. The tricky part about the podcast community is that where my show is at right now, it's gotten pretty large. And there's no one to really talk about certain things with that are there. You're facing similar problems. Mm -hmm. I know I give the same advice to so many podcasters and it's always ignored because what they really want is for you to confirm what they're doing already. And, you know, the biggest problem I see with most podcasters is, is that they don't, it's like, I want to talk about something, the end. And they just talk about it. They don't think of an actual format for the show. I think that's very important and they don't invest anything in it. Right? Right. This is a media property, a podcast. It's no different than the Avengers. The scale is different, obviously, but the Avengers, the second Avengers, the last Avenger movies that came out, everyone in the world knew this movie was coming out, right? It was part two of a series, yet they still spent $200 million in promotion. Yeah. Right? So if they have to do that, why do you think that a podcast can magic this discoverability problem in podcasting does not exist? Mm -hmm. Or I should say it's no different than it is discoverability in music or books or television. Everyone thinks, oh, if we just had a YouTube for podcasting. No. Do you know how many tens of millions of YouTube channels there are that no one watches? YouTube does not solve that for them. Books. Why does someone sign with a publisher as opposed to just releasing a book by themselves? Primarily, it's promotion and distribution. That's the real reason for it. Why does someone sign sign with a uh, a recording studio and music? It's promotion. Mm -hmm. And so with podcasting, promotion is really kind of the thing. And if you don't do any promotion or you just rely on sending out a tweet or an Instagram post, nothing's ever going to happen because the people on social media and the reason why social media doesn't work is because it's primarily people who already follow you. And when you launch a show, by all means, tell your audience about it. But after they know, they've already made the decision to listen to you or not. And constant promotion of new episodes probably isn't going to do that much. Yeah, preach. <laughs> so for the final question, Lauren Passell 
who you probably know, she has podcast, the newsletter, and she's a marketing podcast, marketing guru, but she suggested I do a recurring question for everyone. And I love that idea. And I think I want my question to be, you're going to be the first person, but to be audit me basically. So I have private parts unknown. It's about sex and love around the world. It's been going for years. I've been iterating on it. It started as something else that was more local and has grown to be like kind of more global in scale. That gets about 25 to 30 K downloads a month. I only release twice a month. And then I have the bleeders about book writing and publishing newish, like six months. I release that biweekly too. And then podcast bestie, which I'm just starting, I guess. Do you have any tips for me? I'm hearing I should be spending a lot on promoting my podcast. Should I be rethinking shorter episodes? Like what would be your tips just on the basis of whatever, you know, going into this for me going forward, if you could give me like an assignment. So I, I went to look at, at what your podcasts were podcast besties. I know what that show's about. <laughs> Given that you have a show about sex, I assumed that the bleeders was about menstruating. Oh, that's hilarious. That's why I added that tag about book writing and publishing. It's really just a play on that misattributed I, I, Ernest Hemingway quote. <laughs> I got that after the fact, but when you just hear something about the bleeders, I had no idea that was about writing. Right. Well, I get um, it. <laughs> and if I think when it comes to podcast titles, I've seen a lot of success, at least like in the history niche, the most successful shows are the history of blank. Mm-hmm. The history of World War II, the history of Rome, the history of England, the history of France, because that's what people are looking for. Right. And I think that uh, even with a show like mine, technically speaking, the title of my show is accurate. I just don't think anyone is searching for it. They kind of stumble upon it, fall in love with it, share it with their friends. So that's why it's kind of taken a while for it to ramp up. So I do think that literalness in a title is really important. Mm -hmm. So I know what Podcast Besties is. It's about podcasting. The sex one, I, I kind of get the idea what it is. Bleeders, I had no idea. I had okay. to like, oh, okay, that's what it's about. I think the benefit of a shorter show, and if you're not doing a scripted show like me, you can batch them, is that, yeah, you are increasing the number of downloads. And if you want to use advertising, and it depends on your, how you're monetizing as well. Roughly speaking, there's a lot of gray area. There are three types of podcasts. There's the hobby podcast, doing it for fun. There is an ad-driven podcast like mine where you want to have a massive audience to get as many downloads as possible, as many ads. And then there's the type of podcast that can have a smaller audience but still be financially successful where they're selling their own product or service. Yeah. They're a coach or they have an online course or whatever. And I think you need to figure out which one of those bins you're in. And there can be some overlap. A writing podcast is most probably going to fall into that bin where... If you have a service or product that you're selling alongside of it, that you could do pretty well. Yeah. So, you know, with private parts unknown, I do sell ads and I'm at the point, you know, if I sold more ads, it would actually be profitable. I pay for the show basically, but I don't really make much money off of it. But I was thinking, you know, the reason I do bi-weekly with that show right now is because I really put a lot into the episodes. They're longer, but maybe for those in between weeks, I could be doing something that's shorter, more of a mini sode, maybe that plays yes. on something I had done before where it's not a huge production lift, but I'm still staying in touch with my audience and increasing my ad revenue. The easiest way to increase your downloads is to double the number of shows. And I tell this to people, even with weekly shows, one of the reasons why Jordan Harbinger has been so successful is he does an interview show but he has three shows a week. He mm -hmm. does two interviews and then he added a third show, which is him answering questions and doing Q&A type things, which is just another opportunity for him to run ads. So even if you have an interview-based show, I think that can maybe still be the pillar of your podcast, but then do a second show a week that's maybe just you or yeah. you and a co-host or whatever that is easier for you to produce, but is another opportunity for people to listen to you. If people truly like the show, I think they will be more than happy to listen to more of it. I love that. 
Yeah. I feel that way with the podcast that I listen to. Well, Gary, this has been delightful. Is there anything else you want to tell the besties before we wrap? Uh, I don't know. Listen to my show. That's what every yeah, podcast Yeah, listen says. to this guy's yeah. show. <laughs> you don't need any help from me, but thank you so much. <laughs>